All right, so good morning, and here we are for another session of MENG 3310 Fluid Mechanics. This is the 15th lecture in the series, and uh, today we'll be moving on to more topics of control volumes and conservation momentum, but I thought first I would do a bit of a review on um, uh, the uh, pressure prisms, really from the point of view of um, the reason I want to look at this a little bit, I know it's out of sequence, but what I want to look at, the reason I want to look at this is because of some of the things I saw when grading the first exam. So I would like to review the basic concept of pressure prisms. And I saw a lot of students when they did this get very confused about the, um, get very confused about the equation we've seen, where, the equation where we look at the centroid of the pressure prism, all of this. I would like to just sort of bring it back to more fundamental basic statics principles and see how you work through something like that. So if I have a fluid that, let's say there's a fluid here. Uh, here's the ground, and then there's a fluid up above it. There'll be a fluid surface up above here. And then let's say there's a surface here. Or let's say there's an object um, here. You know what, maybe I can look at something like this. Let's say I had a wall here. And I wanted to find the moment. So this pressure is, is going to generate a force on this wall. And I wanted to find the moment generated by po at point A by the force of this fluid. So I wanted to find the, um, this might be something like a hydroelectric dam, it could be a fish tank, it could be any number of things. The basic idea is that this is going to have a certain overturning moment that has to be resisted via um, a rigid joint here, dead weight, whatever you are doing to resist the, um, the forces therein. So we know that fluid is going to exert a pressure. And if I look at the free body diagram of this thing, of this wall, I'm going to have something like this. So there would be a reaction, let's say it's just cantilever and there's a reaction force there. Well, there would be the weight of the wall pushing down. Well, we could, let, if we consider the wall, well, let's consider the wall weightless. So if I consider the wall weightless, I would have a, um, well, the let's look at the pressure force here. The pressure force would be something like this. It is a triangular pressure prism. That's why we're calling it a pressure prism. And um, then the reaction, there'd be some sort of X reaction like this. And we also need to prevent this thing from overturning. So this force, as I've drawn it here, is going to generate a clockwise moment. So therefore, there must be a counterclockwise moment resisting it. Okay? So the way we handle this is we've, we want to find the pressure at the top or the bottom. Now, um, we can have problems that are laid out two different ways, or multiple different ways. You could have something that's like a, um, if the wall is fully submerged and we're only interested in the, so in the, um, some common problems might be something like, you might have a gate that is down, that is submerged, and then it becomes a little more complicated. If I ask, if I have a gate on a hinge, and I ask you what kind of force must be applied down here, to prevent it from rotating, well then it's not going to be a triangular, but it's going to be a trapezoidal um, pressure prism. Oh, something more like that. It's trapezoidal. And the way we look at this is we the way we solve this is we um, we need to find the moment, right? We need to find the force and the moment generated about this point via this force. Now, um, I want to bring this ba back to basic statics. So we remember from statics um, how to work with beams and how to work with uh, forces and moments, etc. So what I want to do is, this is a pressure. I have a P1 here, and we can find the P1 and the P2 just by using um, P1, P2, where P is just rho GH. So at each of these heights, we'll find the pressure. So at each of these heights, we find a pressure. And so let me show you, I'm, I'm basically considering for um, surfaces of fixed width, of constant width. Oh. 
surfaces of constant width. So the example on the exam, or the problem on the exam, had a simple rectangular gate. And a lot of people are trying to apply the formula for moment of inertia and things like that, which if you have a more complicated shape, like I give you a circular gate, or I give you a triangular gate, or something like that, in that case, yes, you're going to have to use a, um, a, the moment of inertia formula. But for something like this, this is so simple that you don't need to use that. And I think a lot of people, what they're getting caught in, they knew the equation, but they didn't really know the significance of it. They didn't know where it was coming from, and they just uh, and they tried to apply the equation. They were applying, they they had the right equation, but because they really didn't know what the things meant, they weren't applying it correctly. And so a lot of people fell into this trap. And that's why I wanted to take time out of class to come back and sort of review this. So if I want to handle this kind of thing, what I need to do is I need to turn those into into a distributed load across the beam. So if this is A and B. I would have A and B here, A and B. Now, I need to turn it into a W1 and a W2, though. If you remember distributed loads from, so pressure, of course, is measured in force per area. But what I want to do is I want to bring this back to statics and measure this in terms of force per length, like pounds per foot or kips per inch or something like that. I, I want a... Um, I want something in terms of force per length. So I would have a W1 and a W2. Well, how do I get the W from the pressure? Well, the W is just going to be the pressure at that depth. Times the width of the, of the object. Width of the surface. That's it. It's just the um, pressure at the depth times width of the surface. So if I go and say, okay, I find P2, I find P1, and then I just multiply by the width of the gate or the width of the wall or whatever it is to get W1 and W2. And now I have something much more familiar. I have something that I can analyze just using statics. I have taken something that is a, uh, something fairly, um, fairly opaque or something, for, or new material at least, that you saw, that you've only really seen for the first time in fluid mechanics, and we're turning it into something that you've seen many, 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 many times in statics, mechanics, materials, etc. And the whole idea then is, I can find, what I want to do is, um, I'm going to go to the next slide here, and the goal is to transform that distributed load into two point loads, two equivalent point loads for the purpose of finding reactions. So then I transform the two distributed loads Distributed loads <coughs> into two point loads. Equivalent point loads. So, uh, remember, if this is definitely review from statics, but I don't mind reviewing. I have this here and this here. This trapezoidal area, this trapezoidal load. And what this is, is fundamentally, this is a summation of a rectangular and a triangular load. So you could get the right answer to this problem by using the equation, etc. cetera. Um, but you had to be very careful, and you had to know what you were doing. It was probably much better to use just a very simple um, uh, sort of statics approach to this. So I have a rectangular load and a triangular load. It is the summation of each of these. And I would have an equivalent load here. So say this is, um, well, if I go back to, remember, W1 plus W2. Well, if I label these, this would have a height of W2, and this triangle here would have a height of W1. Or actually, no, um, W1 minus W2. It's the difference between the higher end and the lower end. And so then I need to find equivalent point loads 
the equivalent point load for this will be right at the center, and it will simply be W2 times the length. The um, equivalent point loads for this, so this would be at L over 2, and then the equivalent point load for this would be at L over 3. If you remember from statics, a, uh, the centroid of a triangular uh, object or of a triangular, a triangular load, doesn't matter what it is, is one-third the length um, from the fat end. So this would be L over 3. And the um, equivalent point load would be equal to um, W, uh, I guess W1 minus W2, that's the height, times the base, which is L over 2. So this is basically BH over 2. The ba the, for the tr remember, the area of a triangle is base times height over 2, 1F base times height. The base of this triangle is L. The height is W1 minus W2. The area of it is this much, is W1 minus W2 times L over 2. And that's the formula for the area of that triangle, um, which will be our equivalent point load. And then we simply find the, um, to find the total load, Well, this will simply be the summation of these two. W2 times L plus W1 minus W2 times L over 2. And then the centroid of this, overall centroid of load, if you remember we're doing centroids and statics, it's just multiplying the load times its coordinate um, the summation of the loads times the coordinates over the uh, total um, over the total load. So it would be something like W two L times L over two plus W one minus W two times L over two uh, times all this over two times L over three. So again, the x-coordinate times the, va the, the um, this, it's the load times the x-coordinate plus the load times the x-coordinate, all divided by the total load. W2L, you know, let me, get, let me be consistent and use the same L, sorry about that. I just want you to think there's two different L's. Being a little sloppy in my labeling. W2 times L. So W2 times L plus um, W1 minus W2 L over 2. So that's going to equal some uh, X value, XC or something. And this becomes your centroid. So you have, basically you have the load, P, you have the centroid. And if you know that the, um, if you have your object, that has a load of P on it, an equivalent point load P on it, and it's at a distance um, XC from the base, you can find any moment or restraining forces that you need. XC. And really, that's it. For a rectangular gate or a rectangular surface, this is very simple. Um, all you're doing is you're starting with the pressures and saying, okay, it's a pressure here, but that is measure. You can really cut. It really comes down to the units. Pressure pressure is measured in something like pounds per square foot, newtons per square meter, something like that, or pascals. And if I multiply a a pressure times a length, I get a force per length. I get a W. And so that's all you have to do. You multiply. You, you start with the pressure. You multiply by the width of the surface that that pressure is applied to. And then you get a W that you can simply apply um, that you can simply apply all the way down the line, and s uh, solve using simple statics. And again, this was W one and W two. Questions on that? Does that make it a little clearer what your how you handle something like that? Again, this is only possible for problems that involve a, uh, a surface of uniform width. If you have something like a circular width or a triangular width, then you actually do have to use the longer formula that involves finding um, 
moments of inertia of the surfaces and things like that. And those are the f and we went through those formulas in the previous lecture, or in the in the lecture on this. But I just wanted to go back and review and sort of see where this is coming from and. Um, and that's what kind of disturb what's kind of bothered me on the exam, I guess, because I think people got really caught up in the formula and they didn't really realize where things were coming from. And it was it was a very simple problem. It was just you had a a, a pressure at one depth, a pressure at another depth. You had a constant width gate. You can solve this with statics. It's very simple when it really comes down to it. Well, relatively simple. All right. So for the actual material for today's lecture, I want to continue talking about. Um, the continuity equation, etc. So we've seen this bit before, but I want to finish up with the continuity equation. And we have seen some of these things before, but we haven't talked about them in such breadth. So again, the continuity equation. And we, of course, know that Q is equal to V over A, or V times A. This is volumetric flow rates, fairly simple. Um, volumetric flow. Volumetric flow rate th uh, Q, I don't know if we've ever uh, directly defined it, but it is, of course, the volume of fluid Um, passing through a control surface with time. So we've seen it before, but this is how it connects to control surfaces. A volumetric flow rate is the amount of fluid, the volume of fluid per second or per hour, whatever it is, um, passing through a control second uh, with s control surface with time. Per time, per unit time. And the formula, of course, is Q is equal to VA, where V is velocity, and A is area. And we've seen this before. Nope, A equals area. Uh, great. Uh, area. Um, also, if uh, rho is constant, if rho is constant, of course, then M dot is going to be proportional to Q. M dot being mass flow rate and rho being density. And so we've seen the exa a few examples of this already. Um, a good example would be the uh, faucet. We've seen that before where the cross-sectional area gets thinner and thinner. Uh, another example would be something like this. Um, I'm going to work through a very quick example on continuity. Uh, maybe another example here. This will be useful when we look more at uh, conservation of linear momentum. But let's say this fo the following system was given. Say we had a Y branch, a Y branch or a T branch or whatever, where we had a, um, a Y duct, basically, where fluid comes in in one pipe and leaves in two. So then, again, this is a Y duct, and the following information is given. Well, I know that I, I'm given the diameters. D3 equals 0 0.1 meter. Uh, D1 is 0 0.07 meter. 0 0.07 meter, and D2 equals 0 0.03 meters. 0 0.03, 0 0.07, and then 0.1. Then I'm also told that the I, that I have some velocities here. D1 is going to be, uh, sorry, V1 is going to be 2 meters per second. V2 is 1 meter per second, and you can probably see where this is going. Uh, V3 is unknown. And so we wish to find uh, find V3. So given, or given, and find. Oh, let me given twice. Find uh, V3. So I'm going to draw my control volume. And my control volume is going to be, well, let me draw the Y duct.
And I am going to purposely draw my control surface like this. I don't need to have it very tightly hug the, um, the pipe as long as it's tightly hugging the um, surfaces where water is leaving. So I have this here. It's going to be directly, uh, it's going to go directly across the, um, the pipe surfaces there. So basically the control surface will be the cross section of the pipe. Well, at, at this place, it will be perpendicular to the pipe. And so this is my control surface. And I'm going to look at the um, volume that is, con that is entering and leaving that control surface. And so let us consider this. Again, I'm going to assume steady state. So solution here, I guess. Solution, assume steady state. And I know that m dot in must be m dot out. And so I can say rho uh, v3, and I'll also assume incompressible. It wasn't necessarily stated, but I will assume um, also incompressible. So I'm going to assume it's the same fluid all the way through and that it's incompressible. So I'm going to, I, so if I work through this, I get p3, v3, a3. This will be the mass flow rate coming in from surface three. And so that's the mass flow rate in, because again, this is this is meters per second, for example. Well, it's not, uh, yeah, I guess that would be meters per second. We're using metric units in this problem. So meters per second times an area that would be cubic meters per second, right? And then if I multiply by a row, a density, so uh, this is another way to think through these. If I have, if I multiply V times A, I know I get a volumetric flow rate Q, which would be in me cubic meters per second. And then if I multiply by rho, I would be multiplying by kilograms per cubic meter. So the meters cube would cancel out and I would get kilograms per second. So I can figure out the, if I can't remember the formula for mass flow rate, I can figure it out just from the units. Uh, assuming again, incompressible flow. And then what's coming out of that will be, um, basically the flow rate leaving on surface one. So that would be row one, V one, A one, and then also row two, V two, A two. Row two, V two, A two. And if you plug and chug, I think you know how to do that. I'm just taking the corresponding values and substituting them in. All of these would be positive, um, et cetera but the final velocity would come to 1.07 meters per second. Just a very simple application of, of the um, flow rate, or sorry, of the continuity equation, and of course applying areas equal pi d squared over four, et cetera, hopefully really not uh, too bad. All right, um, what else? Okay, maybe one more problem on the flow rate, or sorry, on the continuity equation. I keep saying flow rate, that's not good. Maybe one more for the continuity equation. And then we can look at uh, the conservation of linear momentum. So let's look at the conservation of linear momentum. So example, this is text, uh, this is example uh, 5.15 in the text, I believe. If my number is accurate, might wanna check that. But I believe it's 5.15 in the text. I need to check that against the most recent edition. It may have changed on me. Okay, the basic idea here is, well, it's kind of the opposite. Uh, previously, I had one channel going to two, and now I'm going to have two channels going to one. And so I'm gonna make it a little bit more interesting via, um, I'm gonna make it a little bit more interesting by having um, two different fluids of different densities entering, the pi uh, entering at one pipe. So let's make this a little bit um, more interesting. Okay. Make this a little bit simpler, or not in, more, not definitely not more, a little simpler. Let's make it a little more complicated. So let me just say this is given. We have a y, we have a y branch again, except this time we're using it in the opposite way. We have two streams coming together instead of separating. 
I'm going to call these ends 1, 2, and 3, as shown here. So 1, 2, and 3. So basically, we'll be going from 1 and 2 to 3. And um, we'll have stuff coming in here and in here and out here. Now, um, Q1 is going to be Q1 is going to be 0 0.1 uh, cubic meters per second, and it's going to be water. And Q2 is going to be 0 0.3 cubic meters per second, but it's going to be uh, a, a fluid of specific gravity equal 0 0.8, and that is alcohol. So this could be at a distillery, or it could be at some sort of, that we could be talking some sort of industrial alcohol, some sort of solvent, something like that, even rubbing alcohol, things you wouldn't want to drink. Um, and, um, but uh, I suppose it could be at some sort of distillery or something, but uh, uh, I'll let you choose your scenario. And then I could have a, then coming out of here is going to be a water and alcohol mix. water and alcohol mix. And basically what I wish to find is right here. Find row mix, and which is going to be row three. So here I'm actually solving for an unknown density. So we're having streams of material coming in and I don't know how they're going to combine. And basically I have two streams of material flying into this tube and coming out of it is going to be some amount of a material, um, uh, some uh, a flow rate, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, this would actually be really interesting. This would actually be a very interesting design problem from an engineering point of view. If you're designing a system or a process, um, it did not. This wouldn't have to be water and alcohol. It could be any number of different things where you'd want to combine two different streams. If you want to produce a certain mixture ratio, all you really have to do is size these two pipes appropriately or not really size them appropriately, you have to size, the, size and pressure them appropriately so that you get, basically if I want my final product to be a mixture of two different things, all I really have to do is make sure that the flow rates are at the right ratios to each other. You do that and you can basically force whatever, um, whatever ratio you want. So, and whatever, and you can get any density between the densities of the two different materials. So let's work through that. So solution, again, I'm going to assume a steady state So solution, well, I'm going to again assume a steady state. So steady state and what this means is that m dot in will equal m dot out. I could define a, I could write out a control surface, but it's going to be just the same as the previous one, so I don't think I'll bother this time. But it's the same idea, m dot in equals m dot out. And then I'm going to write uh, the equation of m dot in and m dot out. So this is also m dot 1 plus m dot 2 equals m dot 3. The mass flow rate at, coming in at, at 1 plus the mass flow rate coming into 2 from 2 must equal the mass flow rate coming out at 3. And then the um, expression for this just expanding this out like I did before, rho 1, a1, v1, plus rho 2, a2, v2, equals rho 2, or sorry, rho 3, a3, v3. Now, um, let me sort of consider this for a moment, though. Notice, do you see a problem with this? I'm sorry. We weren't given areas. Uh-oh. But I don't have areas. What am, I, am, I, am I just going to have to give up and go home? No, well, we don't want to do that. No, we're, we, we, we are No, we are not going to do that. We're patriots here. We're not going to give up. We're not going to go home. We're never getting out of here. Oh, wait, that's not the right way to say that. Um, I mean, we're not, we're not going to give up. We're going to persevere. Yeah. Um, anyway, so this one is, we can realize that this one is Q1, um, Q2, and this one is Q3. And this one is Q3. And so then, 
I can rewrite this. I can also say that P1 is row, or row one is row water and row two is row alcohol. So I could write this as row water, row water um, times Q1 plus row A, I'm gonna let row A be row alcohol, uh, times Q2 equals row mix times Q3. And I can also, of course, realize that via continuity, because I'm going to assume that it's incompressible, um, water and alcohol are both generally incompressible, and uh, I know that Q1 plus Q2 <coughs> is equal to Q3. This equation will always be true. It doesn't matter whether a substance is compressible or incompressible, it doesn't matter. The mass flow rate will always be the same coming in as going out as long as it's steady state. This is something that's never going to be violated, okay? Um, as long as there's not a, as long as there is not material bunching up in the system or something like it. Now, an example where the mass flow rate would not be constant would be something like, imagine I had a stream of gas coming in and then maybe there was a, I don't know, like a big fat pipe, a boiler or something like that, a chamber, and then maybe I had a really tiny pipe coming out of it and I was just pressurizing the system. Maybe I was like, uh, maybe there was just at air pressure before and I just turned on the pump and this thing is building up, building up, building up, building up pressure and there's only a tiny tube for it to escape. It won't keep increasing infinitely. Eventually this will reach at such a point that the mass flow rate in will be the mass flow rate out. But while this thing is pressurizing, maybe at that point the mass flow rate will not equal in and out. But uh, in all steady state systems, that, that would not be a steady state system. It would be a system that is changing with time. But once it reaches a steady state, even then, the mass flow rate would be constant. We cannot just create or destroy matter. Um, we're not doing any really crazy nuclear reactions that are changing a significant fraction of the mass. And if your machine is doing that, you are going to know it very quickly. Or actually, you won't know it very quickly because you won't be able to know anything very quickly because you'll be a, st a storm of plasma very quickly. But let's not worry about such things. Um, let's not build any machines that do that. Um, but that's not really something we need to worry about because even nuclear reactors don't change a significant fraction of the mass of... Um, anyway, let's get back to flu uh, fluid flow. Getting off on a tangent. So Q1 plus Q2 equals Q3. And if I plug these together, I can get that row one, or uh, row water, Q1, plus row A, uh, Q2. It will be equal to row mix times Q1 plus Q2. And if you do a whole bunch of plugging and chugging, um, so basically, I know this is row one, I know row water, I know Q1, I can find row alcohol by multiplying 0.8 times row water, I know Q2, I know Q1 and Q2, I know everything except row mix, I can solve for it very easily, and I will get that row mix, if you run through the numbers, you will get that the row mix is equal to 849 kilograms per cubic meter. And that is going to be the density of our final uh, uh, answer here. All right, questions on that? Okay, well, I think I'll let, it, I'll let you go today. We, uh, we, again, um, on Friday, we'll continue uh, looking, and we'll continue on to look at uh, the, the conservation of linear momentum, continuing with continuity, and um, this time with applied to systems of conservation of linear momentum. We'll be looking at momentum flow rates effectively. All right, that'll do it for today. If you have any questions, feel free to see me during office hours. I will see you all on Friday, and as always, thank you.